Hey guys, it is time for a brand new Q&A video and I'm really excited about this one because this tier of the Patreon campaign has grown quite a bit. In case you're new to the channel, I have a Patreon campaign up and running and one of the tiers is to send in a question for this monthly video. And we have so many questions to get to today. Hopefully Dewey doesn't distract too much by knocking everything off this set, even though it's bound to happen. Not wasting any time here. An early thank you to everybody who submitted questions. I really appreciate your support. Jumping right into it now, we're kicking things off with a big question from Evan who wants to know, with Game of Thrones coming to a close soon, I thought a Game of Thrones question was in order. This show is rich with amazing and lovable characters with so many colors. Some you hate in the beginning but grow to love later, some you love in the beginning but start to dislike later, and some are simply misunderstood like Joffrey, Roose Bolton, and Ramsay. Because there are such rich characters, there is so much to learn. So I'm wondering, what are some of your favorite lessons you've learned from the characters in Game of Thrones, perhaps traits that you admire and seek to emulate, like Gendry's running for your New York marathon. All right, Evan, I am kicking off this conversation by pointing out that my favorite character of all of Game of Thrones is Brienne of Tarth. And I especially like how you phrase the question towards the end where you say perhaps traits that you admire and seek to emulate. And really, if I had to pick one character in Game of Thrones to want to emulate, it would be Brienne. There's the obvious element of her operating in a man's world and the way she carries herself. Also her integrity. I mean, how easy is it for someone, whether you're operating in a sphere like Game of Thrones or even in real life, whether it's your work or your personal life to second guess yourself. And she is someone that just so strongly and wholeheartedly sticks to the pillars that make her who she is. And the idea that when she makes a promise, she never breaks it. She's got courage for days and she always stays true to her morals. I mean, I really wouldn't mind becoming a person like that. So I am selecting Brienne of Tarth for all of my lessons in Game of Thrones right now. Moving on to question number two. This one comes to us from Ian who's asking, did you have any scary slash traumatizing movies you watched as a kid? Have you gone back to revisit them when you were older? This first one that comes to mind here is actually something that might pop up at the end of the video, but I have to go with Killer Clowns from Outer Space. I must have been something like five or six when I first saw that movie and because I was a teeny tiny child, I looked at it as a straightforward horror movie, and it wasn't until I grew up and rewatched it that I realized, oh, that is a horror comedy. Another one that really scared me as a kid was Poltergeist. That was probably one of the first instances I remember taking a movie home with me where I would have dreams about it and it would keep me up at night, and now it's one of my favorite horror movies out there. I love it so much now. Also, this is really random, but one of my biggest fears when I was a kid was whenever I would go to bed, I would look up to the ceiling because that's where we had our fire detector and I wouldn't be able to fall asleep until I saw it flash to make sure the battery was working because I was totally traumatized by a Sesame Street VHS tape. It was Sesame Street home video visits the firehouse. I know the two are connected. I can picture it in my brain and that led to me never being able to go to sleep when I was a kid without making sure the fire alarm was working. But fast forwarding to something that scared me as an adult even, I've got to go with the movie Martyrs. And actually that is one that I refuse to watch again. I think a lot of it is very, very well done, but it's, it's scary and it's not just scary, it's also upsetting and I did not like how that movie made me feel, not just immediately after I watched it, but days after. So if you like it, all the power to you. But to be completely honest, Martyrs was a bit too much for me. And I think even traumatized me a little as an adult. Question number three now. We are moving over to Michael. And Michael's question this time is, how do you decide which movies to see at a movie festival? I am glad you asked this question, Michael, because I've got a little bit of a process here. So first step of this process is, as soon as I know that I'm going to a festival, I go through the entire lineup and I make a separate document that has all the movies that I want to see. And the way I pick those movies, three ways. First talent that I'm looking forward to seeing what they're working on next. I'll read the synopsis and if that story intrigues me, I'll put those on the list. And then also because I cover for my outlet Collider, I have to think what are the Collider priorities and those go on the list as well. Then when I actually get on the ground and start to see movies, 
I've got to kind of be really aware of what's picking up steam, what people are buzzing about, and those have to be added to my schedule as well. So then you're busy trying while you're on the ground at a festival to get additional tickets. Then one of my favorite parts about a film festival is the last day or two when my schedule usually dies down and I have free blocks of time because then those free blocks of time are what they are. So I'm pretty much just looking within a range of, I don't know, let's say two hours and looking at what's playing at that time. And I have to see whatever that is. A lot of times that's how I discover hidden gems. It actually just happened recently at South by Southwest. So I had a couple of hours before I saw The Curse of La Llorona and there was something like three or four movies playing at the time. And the only one that would work for my schedule based on where La Llorona was playing was Boy Band Con. It's a great documentary. I am so happy that I got to see it. And it was something that I did not plan on whatsoever. And it just happened to fit in my schedule in that moment. So plan your festival, but also don't be afraid to leave open blocks of time to discover something new and find some hidden gems in the mix. Next question is up right now. And this one is a question from Kaiser. Kaiser's asking, why do you think people hate indie horror films such as Mother and the Witch, but love mainstream horror such as The Conjuring and A Quiet Place? I don't think it's as cut and dry as saying people hate indie horror and they love mainstream horror. And using these two movies that you name here, Mother and the Witch, is a little bit of a jumping off point. I want to start by addressing personal taste because I think that's a major factor here. I mean, take me for example. I love the whole horror genre and I will always stay open-minded to anything out there offered to me, but there is no doubt that one of my favorite subsections of the genre is the slasher subgenre. And when I see a slasher movie, I am likely more prone to enjoy it than maybe somebody who doesn't like slasher movies. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. I mean, looking at this year of film, for example, I loved Escape Room. I looked at that movie and after I walked out of that movie, I'm like, that was a movie for me. And if it wasn't for you, no big deal at all. But it suits my personal taste. And when you name movies like Mother and the Witch, I think the viewership is narrowed a little in terms of hitting that specific personal taste, pretty much because those are more challenging films. And I think that's also what this conversation comes down to a lot is when you have a movie that is a major crowd pleaser, let's say with a happy ending, yeah, you're going to have more people walk out rah-rah loving it and just buzzing with positivity versus something that has a darker ending, maybe is a little more challenging like a movie like Us where it's more challenging to put the pieces together. Or for example, recently, this is what I think might have happened a little bit with Pet Cemetery, is that Pet Cemetery is a movie about mortality and death and it is a tough, tough watch. So when I wound up seeing that cinema score of being a C plus, that did not surprise me whatsoever. It doesn't take away from my love of the film at all, but I totally get why some aren't into it. So I don't think it's a love or hate thing going on right here. I think it comes down to personal taste and also whether or not you're in the mood to kind of like sit back and relax and go on a wild, horrific ride or you want to have your mind put to the test and really be challenged as a viewer in the seat. And you know what? Both types of movies are totally fine. It's a matter of what you want in the moment. So everything can work right here. All right, moving on to this next question here. And it's from Luke. And Luke is asking, who is an actor or actress you wish got to be a lead more often? I've got two answers for you here, Luke. And the first one here is an all-time favorite for me. It is Doug Jones. One, he is a wonderful human being. If you ever get the opportunity to cross paths with Doug Jones at a convention, a festival, wherever he's out and about, take it because he is super kind. He loves the material he works on and I really appreciate that. Also, he is crazy talented. And the thing is, I feel like most of the things I've seen him in, he's playing, let's say, the evil entity. He's a creature. He's a side character. And he never really gets to shine in the spotlight. But we did see him do it a lot in Star Trek Discovery, these first two seasons here. And he's so good as Saru. But I'm thinking back to The Shape of Water and he just didn't seem like he got enough attention. I know it was Sally Hawkins is wonderful, Octavia Spencer is wonderful, and you know how much I love Guillermo, and of course Michael Shannon and Richard Jenkins, but why were we not talking about Doug Jones more? The way he carries the prosthetics and the makeup and the physicality, so much of that performance is him, and 
he didn't get nearly enough love in my eyes. So I want to see him have more lead roles. I love his character work when it comes to embodying a creature, but I wouldn't mind seeing him do a role as himself as well. Maybe one day. The other one I want to mention right now is Jackie Weaver. She has got two supporting nominations for an Oscar right now, and it's for Animal Kingdom and Silver Linings Playbook. She is phenomenal, but I feel like after Animal Kingdom, I really have only seen her in supporting roles, usually supporting roles that don't really do her abilities justice. So I am also rooting for Jackie Weaver to step in the spotlight and lead something big real soon. Moving on to the next one now, we have a question from Kavi, and Kavi's asking, what's the first movie you remember seeing? This is where Killer Clowns from Outer Space comes back into the conversation, because that is one of the first movies I remember seeing ever. I was at a friend's house, I remember who the friend was, I remember sitting on the floor in her living room looking up at the TV, I remember what the house looks like, everything. I so vividly remember that experience, and then my first memory in a movie theater is actually Batman Returns. I don't know why my parents thought it was okay to take, it was me, it was my little sister, and then we went with another family who had kids our age too, and we were definitely way too young to see Danny DeVito as the Penguin, and it freaked me out, but I do remember being fascinated by his performance too, and I, I remember loving the movie, and still to this day, I love Batman Returns, and eventually, after I saw Batman Returns, then I saw the 89 Batman, and those two movies have a place in my heart always, so I guess I kind of am glad my parents wound up taking me. Next question now is a really cool one from Ryan. He's asking, if a film that you hold close to your heart gets a remake, who should direct, write, act, produce, etc.? Usually I get really sensitive when I try to think about some of my favorite movies being remade, as I imagine many of you do out there, but then I thought of a really cool idea that really excites me. You guys know how into reading Stephen King books I am right now, or at least listening to the audiobooks, and one of my favorite Stephen King adaptations of all time, it's one of my top five movies of all time, it's Stand By Me. And then I started to think about it, and I loved the idea of replacing the main four characters with some up-and-coming young actresses, and I came up with this group that I thought was just mind-blowing to me. I want to recast that movie with Shahadi Wright Joseph from Us, McKenna Grace, who was just in Captain Marvel, she was in Haunting of Hill House, so many other things, Elsie Fisher from Eighth Grade, and then Millicent Simmons from A Quiet Place. Just picturing the four of them in those roles, I don't know who would play who, but it's kind of mind-blowing to me. And then I would, of course, want to bring in Guillermo, because I think anything he touches is better off. So let's bring him in as a producer. And for the director role, I have two options here that I'm really excited about. If you've never seen the movie Mustang, I highly recommend checking that one out, and I wouldn't mind seeing that director, I hope I pronounce her name correctly, Denise Gamze Erguven. I probably pronounced that wrong, but hopefully you can figure it out and then go find Mustang wherever it's available. It's a great coming of age film. Or I would sub in Angela Robinson, who directed Debs way back in the day, and she also directed the Professor Marston movie that I love so much that didn't make waves whatsoever, and it was so good, and it should have. But that right there, I think it might be my Stand By Me dream team for a remake. So, Ryan, thanks for encouraging me to think about that. That got me really excited. We've got one more question to hit today, and it is a question from Billy. Billy wants to know, what was it like seeing a review quote from you on a Blu-ray? Honestly, it was mind-blowing, and that hasn't changed so many years later. Not even Blu-rays, but... I'll never forget my very first quote for a movie. It was in the newspaper, and it was for Harry Brown, the movie with Michael Caine, and I had a little blurb, and I believe I gave it four stars, and that's what was in there. I have it framed in my parents' house still. Also, speaking of newspaper ads, one of my favorite ones of all time is I got a full-page ad in the New York Times for Vampire Academy, and I'm always rooting for that film. You might have heard me say that before, but I'm really proud of that quote. I'm also really proud of having the box quote on the Evil Dead remake, a movie I absolutely adore. And at one point after that movie came out, I got to see Fede Alvarez and Jane Levy, and they both signed it for me. I've got that hung up in my apartment, and it's framed, and it's beautiful. 
really, those things mean a lot to me because I put a lot of stock in the movies that I give permission to give quotes to because they reach out to you and they ask for your approval before they use it, or for the most part at least. And even though it's very cool to see your name on a TV ad, in newspaper, let's say, on a DVD box, I don't ever want it to be there for something that I'm not going to wholeheartedly get behind. So if you do ever see a quote of mine out and about, it's because it really means something to me and because I really believe in that movie. Wow. Guys, thank you so much for these questions. I want to name you again. Evan, Ian, Michael, Kaiser, Luke, Kavi, Ryan, and Billy. Thank you guys so much. I'm sure you know how much I appreciate you being part of the campaign, but also thank you for putting so much thought into these questions because it really does make this video a total blast to do on a month to month basis. So guys, thank you. A huge thank you to everybody out there for watching this video. I hope you enjoy it. If you wanna submit a question like these guys did, it is super easy. There's a link at the bottom of this video right now that'll take you on over to the Patreon campaign and you'll find the tiers with the explanations right there. So go check it out. Another thank you, like and share the video and I will see you next month with another Patreon Q&A.